Hello and welcome to another edition of Straight from the Training Ground, the podcast where we share our love for their beautiful game and people out in their communities doing beautiful things. Tonight we're very excited to have David Cope with us, uh, the boys head coach at Mount Battle Mountain High School sorry, in uh, Edwards, Colorado. Uh, he's a longtime coach, has a unique story, uh, very unique uh, uh, community, I think, out there that we're going to talk about. So, uh, David, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Great to great to be with you. Uh, yeah, we're an interesting place. It's a resort community, so it's the public high school that serves the, you know, resorts of Vail and Beaver Creek, and um, and it's you know, a hundred miles from Denver. So it's difficult, but not impossible for the kids to play on club teams in the big city. Okay. Um, so we have a nice club up here, the Vail Valley soccer club and um, just a community that has a huge appetite for, for the game. You know um, the ski areas were founded by people from central Europe and a lot of Germans and Austrians and those guys. And then um so they brought the game. You know, one of the first things that was built in the town of Vail was soccer field, you know. Um, cool. <clears throat> and then they, uh, you know, from there, like a lot of the people that were drawn to ski communities and ski towns tended to be from the suburbs back east who had played and growing up. And so there were a lot of kids who moved here with a, a really good background. And now they have children going through the schools. Um, and then in the last kind of 25 years or so, it's become a real um, – community for central american immigrants and so there are a ton of people coming here and so i coach a lot of kids who are primarily spanish speaking um and so there's just a a real eclectic mix of people in our community oh very cool very cool uh, we'll get into that here in a little bit uh but first of all why don't you just tell everyone out there a little bit about your own personal background in soccer uh growing up how did you get involved and, and kind of what led you out there yeah, so I'm an immigrant myself. Um, my dad and mom are English, and they moved out here in the in the early '70s um, to Connecticut. We we were living in New England, and um, you know, one day they were on their way to go play tennis and saw some kids playing soccer and tried to drop me off so they could have a peaceful game of tennis. <laughs> and uh, as soon as they heard my dad's English accent, that was it, and there was no more tennis. And he ended up you know, driving yeah. around the East coast, going to tournaments and coaching teams and doing all that. And, um, and so I grew up with that and the cosmos were going at that time and we were in the New York Metro area. So fortunate enough to go see Pele and Beckenbauer and Giorgio Canale and all those guys. And, yeah, um, just fell in love with it, you know, um, just walking into giant stadium and the, the scope of it and the, and the stars that we got to see and, um, and then we would combine that with going back to Britain to visit uh, relatives and trying to catch games when we were back there and, you know, watching the hour long program of highlights on PBS that was a, a, week, yeah. a week delayed, you know. And um, so I, I feel like a kinship to a lot of the boys on my team now who watch a lot of the Mexican League games. And it, it is a connection for their families back to home, you know. And, yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and so that was me. And then we moved to Pennsylvania when I was in high school. I was fortunate enough to play at Mount Lebanon High School, kind of a soccer powerhouse uh, in the western part of the state there. We were the first team from western Pennsylvania to win a state championship. And uh, and then from there, I wanted to play soccer in college. Um, I went to a Division three school in upstate New York called Union College and played there for four years and met some great people and loved it. And then after college, did a couple stints as assistant coach back East and then um, was working in Vail in the winters. And I was the classic person who came for one season and never left, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then I got involved with the high school team here and, and um, have been coaching them for 30 years. Wow, that's that's pretty awesome. That's a great story. And then, uh, so you you were a high school teacher as well, correct? And I know um, um, off camera we were talking a little bit more about your background. Uh, you don't just you currently coach the boys, but why don't you tell everybody about your history as a high school coach because you've had a pretty unique uh, experience with that as well. Yeah, so I um, I began uh, coaching the boys team, and I was working on the ski area mountain in the winter. Um, and then just being involved and around the kids, 
it really whetted my appetite for education. You know, um, working with kids on the, on the resort was great, but they'd be here for a few days and then they'd go off somewhere. Mm-hmm. And working with kids on the team, you'd get to know their families and you'd see them grow up and the whole thing. So that kind of pushed me back into education. So I went to CU and got a master's um, and then my teaching certificate. And so I was able to start coaching at the high school. And at the time, there was no girls team here. And this is kind of the early 90s. And so if there was girl, if there were girls who were really uh, love the game, they would try to play on the boys team. And some of them okay. did. You know, we had Olympic skier Sarah Schlepper was on our team and we yeah. had some kids who did really well. And then uh, they start. I helped them start the girls team and they ran through a couple of different coaches. And then um, I can remember my AD said, hey, will you help me find a girls coach? We, you know, we need another girls coach. And uh, that week somebody was installing hardwood floors at our house. And I remember <laughs> watching this carpenter work and I was like, you know, I couldn't do this job. Like he's so organized. He's got the tools. He's laying everything out perfectly. And and I was like, I guess you do where what your skill set leads you to, you know. <laughs> exactly. And I'm a coach, and so so I'm gonna coach. So I went back in and told the AD, I think I found you a girls coach, and um, and then I took over that team. And uh, my daughter grew up around it, and she ended up playing for us for four years and going on to play in college. And so for a long time, I would coach both in Colorado. We have boys in the fall and girls in the spring. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so then this past year I retired from the classroom and I also gave up the girls team so that my wife and I could do a little more traveling and in, in the spring and skiing and, you know, do the things that, that, uh, that we want to do. Um, but we love the fall season here and we love being in Colorado in September and October and, um, being around the boys team. And so I continued with the boys. Um, and this was my first fall out of the classroom, but still coaching. And it worked out pretty well because we won state. Oh, well, congrats on that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so what, you know, with the, the unique community that you have out there, what are some challenges? Someone like you who's coached for a long time, uh, both on boys and the girls side, what are some challenges you face trying to build a program uh, in a unique community like that? Yeah, it's it's an interesting place because I think we have as wide a range of demographics as anywhere in the country. You know, there are people who sell a business for hundreds of millions of dollars and move out here and buy a home and will never have to work and neither will their kids or grandkids. Um, And then we have migrant workers who come here who have three or four jobs and are scrapping to um, to make a living. And when I first started coaching at the high school, a lot of the kids who were Hispanic and um, immigrant kids, they wanted to play American sports to kind of assimilate and to become a part of the community. And it took a while to convince them that like, you know what, there's a place for you in this game and in this community at the same time. Um, And you can be an American and you can play. And, um, and so that's been, so they, um, so they didn't want to play soccer. No, you know, at first, when I first arrived here in the nineties, there were a lot of these kids who, who they wanted to integrate into this American culture and American society. And so they wanted to play American football and they wanted to play basketball and baseball. Okay. And traditional sports, you know, um, and it took a while for us to be able to convince these kids that like, hey, you know what, the community will value you. You can kind of become a part of it by playing soccer. And, and if that's the sport you love, let's let's play it. Um, and then we have such a wide range of demographics. Like I'll have a kid on, on our 2012 state championship team. We had a kid who was playing center back. Um, whose dad owned four restaurants in Beaver Creek and, you know, had this kind of little empire. And he's playing center back next to a kid whose dad washes dishes in one of those restaurants. Oh, you know? <laughs> wow. Um, so it's really unique. It's a, it's a unique place. You know, um, I was teaching a history lesson where one of the girls in class was like, how much did they pay for the Louisiana purchase? And I was like, 15 million. She goes, no, no, it must have been billion. That can't be right. And I said, well, look it up, look it up in the book, you know. And then she let slip that like, oh, wait, that's less than my house in Beaver Creek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so we have that. And then we have kids who, you know, we buy their socks for them and we buy their shoes for them because they're, they're just trying to get by and make it in America. So it's really fun to see those different groups of kids integrate and become teammates. And they don't even question it. You know, they just they just uh, become friends and and uh, 
it's a beautiful thing to watch that happen. And I think it's a great model for our country. I was going to say, it's, it's really cool, uh, you know, uh, to see how that works within team sports, you know, when all those kind of things get pushed aside and you're just working together to yeah. try to accomplish a goal together, you know, but definitely a very unique situation. Yeah. And it's really powerful, I think, for the rest of our community and our school to see it because, you know, people can live in, in separate worlds, even within the same community. And so mm -hmm. when you see these kids like celebrating a goal and, and working hard and supporting each other and, and you start to realize like that's humanity right there. That's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely, man. Very cool. So what are your uh, uh, real quickly, what are your plans for the future uh, with the program? What would you like to, to see? Uh, you know, in the future, you know, you have a very successful program. Obviously, it's come a long ways, but uh, where would you like to see it in the next few years? Well, it's interesting because when we won it in 2012, I never thought that that would happen. You know, I just thought we were so remote from the big city. And when we eventually made it down into the playoffs and played these teams from the suburbs, you know, we didn't fare very well. So we won it. And I thought, man, that's mission accomplished, you know, mm -hmm. and then I kept coaching for another eight, 10 years. And then the temptation was if we ever win it again, mic drop, walk away. You know? <laughs> and then we yeah. win it this year. And then you start looking at the roster and who you, who you bring him back potentially next year, you know, our leading goal scorer, our keeper, our center back, our captain, you know, our creative midfielder that, you know, assisted the winning goal are all coming back. And so the reality sets in, like, I'm not walking away from this. You know, this is, is yeah. really, really fun. And the, the thing I'd like to do over the next few years is get more of these kids to go back into the game when they graduate. I'd like to see more of them become coaches, more of them become referees um, and stay involved. You know, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting to talk to kids about teaching and coaching as a profession. And I'm telling these kids, like, you know, the, the world needs you and you can make a real difference, you know? And I, I know that sometimes the teaching profession gets a, a, some bad publicity, but if you're not going to be a midfielder for Manchester United, but you want to <laughs> stay involved in the game, this is a great way to do it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm just trying to like push more of our kids into, into going into getting their coaching licenses and, or becoming referees or, or, you know, somehow giving back to the game because um, that's the next generation. And I think for me as an older coach now, I want to mentor younger coaches in all sports, you know, so I'm starting to attend a few more basketball practices and, you know, it's twofold. Yeah. It's selfish because I get to watch some of my guys that just one state play basketball and I get to watch younger coaches put together yeah. their practices and, and maybe I can offer, a little bit of guidance along the way. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'm really glad you brought up the fact, I think not just in your community, but I think in our entire country, uh, you know, I try to do that myself as a coach, uh, regardless of how a game goes. If I see, you know, a high school kid refereeing or just being a linesman, um, I always try to make a point to go over, you know, to that young man, that young lady and give him a positive word of encouragement and just say, you know, Hey, keep, keep refereeing, uh, keep staying involved. Because like you said, we need, you know, we have enough younger people that have played now. Their parents have grown up in this country a lot and played that we need those people to be involved uh, to, to help the game continue to evolve in a positive direction. So For sure. um, we, we did a fun thing this fall. We had an open training and we invited a bunch of the local middle school coaches. Um, and so, you know, they sat in the bleachers and were able to watch us run through a typical training session that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I have phenomenal assistant coaches. And uh, so they could kind of run the training and I was able to stand in the, in the bleachers and kind of talk through like, you mm -hmm. know, look for this, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. And, um, and it was great because a lot of those middle school coaches had actually played for me. Yeah. So, so they remembered, but now they were seeing it from a coach's eye instead of a player's eye, which is much different. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, so I know you, you told me a little bit about when we talked before uh, about a, a, a program, I guess you would call it, uh, for some rings and, and to congratulate your team and, and to do it throughout the community uh, for your state championship. You want to explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, thanks. It's something we're really proud of. So when we won state, um, I noticed that the state didn't give the boys anything individually. You know, we got the trophy and the trophy will go in the trophy case at school. 
Mm -hmm. And when we had won it in Pennsylvania, each player got a little medal and it had the PIAA, the Pennsylvania yeah. thing on it. And it was great. So what we decided to do was not all of our boys could afford to buy a championship ring or, a, or something to commemorate it. So I got people around the community to donate money. And then each boy earns their ring through doing community service. And so they each have to do a set number of hours, 15, 20 hours. And we have them working for like the Salvation Army, for Habitat for Humanity, for um, reading to little kids, coaching. Um, there was a middle school tournament that some of our boys went and refereed games. Um, mm. And they were at a semi-pro hockey game the other night, recycling and, and helping sort the trash. And so it's just a great thing because nobody's allowed to buy their ring. Everyone has to earn it. So there okay. are some of these kids who parents will donate money and pay for more than one ring. You know, um, other kids, when we were working at the Salvation Army the other night, it was a beautiful thing because these kids were doing such a great job unloading this big semi truck full of food for families that are in need around the holidays. And it could be that one of our players ends up being a recipient of that. And so yeah. they're they're both on the giving end and receiving end, you know. Um, and so then this spring, when the, they also got to design the rings. And so this oh, cool. spring, when uh, the rings are ready and delivered, we'll have a ring ceremony and every kid will get his, his championship ring. Um, and they'll feel like they earned them, you know, and that's what we yeah. want. And, and then there's a, you know, there's a little selfish reason, too, because when they show up at a place as a group to work, they get a lot of attention, you know, people are yeah. like, oh, you the guys are the one that won state, you know, and um, so it's a great program. I would encourage other coaches to do it. And, you know, it takes some legwork on my part um, to set up a GoFundMe and to go solicit the donations. And then um, we just do a sign up genius and the boys sign up for the work. And I think they're really having fun volunteering and yeah. seeing that giving back to the community. It's not just all giving. You get something from it. You feel good about it. Absolutely, man. That's, that's a great idea. I love it. And uh, I really like the fact that even if you can't afford it, that every player earns it that way. Yeah. And, and you know, I think as a coach, I'm sure you would agree. It, it, something like that means a lot more to you if you had to do something like that to earn it. I mean, not that you didn't earn it by winning, you know, yeah, the state, yeah. but, but to do something like that together as a team, uh, it's going to mean a lot more later on to them. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you forget the finality, whether you win or lose in the playoffs, there's such a sudden finality, like it's over. And then we yeah. all split up and go our separate ways. So this allows them to kind of transition out of it a little bit more easily, you know? And um, so when they go and work together, they're spending more time with their friends. You yeah. Know? And that's what we talk about through the playoffs is let's win today. Not, not just for the sake of winning, but, but so we can spend another week practicing together so we can prepare for another game so we can spend time together. Yeah. That's, that's what they're doing right now. So it's really fun. Absolutely, man. What a really cool idea. I love it. Uh, and thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. And thank you for taking your time to uh, hang out with us today here on Straight from the Training Ground. Again, uh, David Cope from Battle Mountain High School in Colorado. Uh, veteran coach, if I might call you that. <laughs> yeah. Boys and girls high school, though, for a long time. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell you, we really appreciate what you've, you've done in that community with so many kids from so many different backgrounds and uh, giving back the way that they are. I think that's, that's just really great to hear that um, because, you know, you and I both know if you coach for a while, there's other people out in communities doing those things somewhere, yeah, somewhere also. And, and, you know, we just haven't heard about it maybe. So really appreciate you. Yeah, I love the variety of guests you have on. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed the Jay Martin one talking about division three soccer and yeah. the challenges there. And I, I think, you know, for, uh, I saw an interview once with Bob Bradley and he was talking about Manny Shellshite and, and there's so many different avenues for soccer right now that it's confusing to families. You know, there's all yeah. these different leagues and, you know, some people say high school's great. Some people say high school's terrible. Yeah. And, and he said in that interview, just do soccer the best you can wherever you are. And, and then kids will be, kids will be drawn to it, you know, and if yeah. kids want to play, they'll, they'll find a place where they can play and have fun and enjoy it. And, um, ultimately that's what we want. We want to create lifelong connections through the game. And, and I hope one day one of these kids is winning their own state championship with their own team. Absolutely. That's what it's all about, isn't it? You know, and the life lessons and things that they learn to help you be successful later on. So uh, yeah, and it's been really cool through this fundraising thing to see high school and college teammates of mine 
donating to buy rings <laughs> for these kids, you know, and that's kind of a fun, like pay it back, pay it forward. Yeah. Yeah. I told those guys, all we want is for you to be lifelong friends, you know, and that's, yep. that's ultimately the benefit of this game. I know you guys started this podcast by getting in touch over the pandemic. Well, yeah. You know, well, the thing as a high, I coach high school and club as well. And, and a lot yeah. of times with high school, I tell the kids the same thing that, you know, you're not always going to remember the final score of a game you know, your sophomore year, you're going to remember those things. Like you said, you know, working at the Salvation Army together, uh, you know, goofing around on the back of the bus after a big win, uh, you know, being an alumni and donating back to the, those are the things you're going to remember you know, yeah. for the rest of your life. And so that's, that's really great, man. So we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, best of luck. Keep up the great work you're doing out there in Colorado. Thank you. Straight from the training ground. Visit our partners at Uno Zero, where they make classic leather football boots. Check out our friends at Duke Tick Brand FC for all of your coaching needs, notebooks, and more. Visit our friends at TractionSocks.com for your grip socks.